There's a bird, a small bird, stuck in my chest, flapping, flapping, trying to get out. And I can get her out, I think I can. But it's going to hurt and bleed and scratch. It's like everything I say or think of saying, these words, some of them, the right words, and she flaps harder and harder, but it's taking too long. I'm not always coming up with the right words and it's happening too fast and I'm, it's a physical thing, it hurts. I can see that this, the bird flaps and twists. Here's this word or this insight. She's trying to help me, or if I start off slower, gentler, or if I get to the point faster or get the best example and the logic, logic has to be airtight and then maybe she'll get out and fly away. But, but I can't find the right way to get her out. And her little claws, they don't want to hurt me, but they're tearing my insides, shredding them into loose flaps. And it sometimes feels like the best thing to do is just calm her down, make all the feathers lie flat. And then usually I reach in with both hands. I hold the bird on either side of its neck and then quick with a sudden sharp jerk, twisting in opposite directions. And the little bones in the bird's neck give way. They just snap. All those slender tendons and muscles and fibers and vessels just and it's over. The flapping has stopped. This is a monologue I wrote for a play called This Exquisite Corpse, which is a play uh, from the perspective of a non-native English speaker, a Korean woman. Uh, English is not her first language. This is actually the second play I've written in English, in English from the perspective of a non-native English speaker. So when I first started writing and I realized that I wanted to write several plays written from the perspective of non-native English speakers, I almost gave up writing then and there because I write in English. And I also have a horrific allergic reaction when I uh, witness quote unquote broken English rendered badly on stage. I just like break out in hives. So, um, cause it's often sort of general and guttural and it just sounds fake. And it, it often is a, a shortcut for laughs or for, you know, um, uh, sentimentality. So I was committed to this perspective, um, I realized. And so the often necessity is the mother in, of invention and soon I came up with other ways of expressing non-fluency while still using English. So in this exquisite corpse, to convey that speaking in a non-native tongue, uh, excuse me, in a non-native language can feel like fighting with your tongue, I have the non-native English speakers wear obstructive mouthpieces. I could ask. And, and, she, uh, uh, and then when I speak English, to a native English speaker, they can speak fluent English, we understand that there's, there's a barrier. <laughs> um, in my play, You For Me For You, a North Korean woman, Juni, is the one we understand best. Uh, but her, and and when she, whenever she's speaking with Americans, for whom English is a their first language, um, the world of language is abstracted so that we understand from her perspective. So the first, uh, when she first arrives in the United States, she's uh, greeted by an American uh, who says, so, vaga faraga ti prepara te fara tamarik aizaseri gimari dadari tun? And then it progresses from there. That, so my commitment, as I said, is, is to the, um, to the uh, non-native English speaker's perspective, that she becomes the one we most can immediately empathize with. So recently I thought about why this is. Why am I interested in how a non-native English speaker expresses? That communication obstacle course in the expressive strategies that someone who can't take um, language for granted in, in the space that they're in. And like so many things in my life, I trace the roots to my parents, for whom English is a second language, after Korean. 
Now, they have different proficiencies in English. My father got a PhD in thermodynamics in London. So actually, he is, for all intents and purposes, fluent, and even sometimes pronounces words with a quaint British accent, like orange and advertisement. <laughs> um, but my mother's English grows and evolves every day. She feels very self-conscious about her, quote unquote, broken English. Um, but she is the best storyteller you've ever met. And she's never, her, her uh, proficiency in English is not a uh, impediment for, her, or, or it doesn't get in the way of her need to express. That's the necessity. So necessity becomes the mother of invention. And she uses metaphor and gesture and different voices and you know and um, it be, really you want to hear a story told by my mother for them my parents language hasn't been a barrier they have led complex dynamic and comprehensive lives uh, and they've cultivated complex dynamic and comprehensive expressive strategies and one of these strategies is to have five children <laughs> born and raised in the US, an architect, two doctors, a sculptor, and me, a playwright. So um, we are all native English speakers, but our first language is M and D, mom and dad. We have learned when, no, I don't want that iPad, actually means Yes, I'll take it if you will get one for dad at the same time and give it as an early Father's Day gift because he doesn't want to ask. Uh, we have learned when a question is an answer and when your question, what happened during the Korean War, is met with silence, we understand that silence is a nonverbal dissertation on pain. My mother, you know, sort of handles us as um, sort of like, I mean, she's, she and my father are very supportive of each of our individual independent lives. And also, we are the tools in her chest. So if there's a problem, it depends on the nature of the problem, and she'll sort of take a look and say, okay, this one needs um, drawing skills and endless patience. Okay, that's for Heather, the architect, and Ted. Then when there's something medical, of course, the two doctors, and it's just a matter of you know who's in surgery or not. And then when there's writing involved, lots of letters to lawyers or contractors, or that was me. Um, to be pr proficient in M&D, you learn to listen with your eyes as much as your ears, you use patterns and historical records as much as nouns and verbs to understand that a simple question like, Mia, when are you leaving for New York? Actually means, can we come too? <laughs> and over time, what you realize is that MND is actually just another iteration of the universal language of human connection. Because no matter what your language, what your fluency, we all speak in silences and indirectness. We all need close listening and to listen beyond the words that are spoken. So that's why when my parents are put in a box or condescended to or underestimated, you just don't underestimate my dad, estimate my dad um, their progeny, the five of us, it's like we're the Avengers. We swoop in and like make sure that all the, the, the gaps are filled in. Um, and it, it, to the point where, you know, my mother will have to sort of like, say, okay, okay back, back, back off, back off. I think we, we, we made our point. Um, it, the point is that they aren't saints or blameless victims or ma paragons of perfection. They're just very much multidimensional human beings that um, because perhaps they haven't found the right adverb or adjective or um, uh, way of uh, pronounce, pronunciation um, can be uh, minimized. 
So I'll leave you with this final piece I wrote. It's a monologue looking for a play. Sora has recently moved to the US from Asia. She is an English language learner, but she speaks this monologue without a trace of an accent. Within her interior space, after all, she is fluent. When you have plenty to eat, you grow a large forehead and dry clean your clothes, though you have a closet full of scotch, whiskey, and champagne that you wear under your arms to smell like money. For a headache, you can choose memory foam, an allergy shot, or return with free shipping, then call in sick as a downward dog, discover your inner hobbies, and massage self-help literature, which, if you're lucky, leads to a fling with your GPS on Egyptian cotton, 800 thread count sheets. If you feel stress, you take a vacation that shapes your brows and go to the spa, where you meet with a marriage counselor who gives you a cello lesson detox treatment so you can hit the sample sales and try on antidepressants. She's interpreting the US. Thank you so much.